Hello everyone and welcome to Amanpour and Company. Here's what's coming up. The people of Israel trust President Trump to make the right decisions uh, that are in the best interests of Israel's security and prosperity. I speak with President Trump's right-hand man and son-in-law Jared Kushner about the landmark Israel-UAE peace deal and election politics. And we get details of the plan with Anwar Gargash, the United Arab Emirates Minister for Foreign Affairs. Plus, what in the world? American foreign policy in the time of Trump and beyond. Middle East scholar Vali Nasser and former Dutch MEP Marit J. Shake join me. And finally. The show must go on. Award-winning composer Andrew Lloyd Webber plays his part to help theatres reopen. Almond Poor and Company is made possible by the Anderson Family Fund, Sue and Edgar Wachenheim III, the Cheryl and Philip Milstein family, Candace King Weir, the Strauss Family Foundation, Bernard and Denise Schwartz, Charles Rosenblum, Jeffrey Katz, and Beth Rogers. Additional support provided by these funders and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to the program, everyone. I'm Christiana Manpour in London. The last Arab-Israeli peace deal was with Jordan a quarter century ago, and the landmark New Deal Israel has struck with the United Arab Emirates highlights the shifting political dynamics in the region, which is broadly marked by a rivalry between Shia Iran and its allies and Sunni Saudi Arabia and Gulf nations. The reaction falls along those lines, too. Iran, Turkey, and the Palestinians denounced the accord, with the Iranians calling it strategically stupid. Palestinian Authority President Mahmoud Abbas calls it an aggression on the Palestinian people. But the deal's most immediate impact would be to stave off Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's plan to annex huge chunks of the occupied West Bank, for now. In exchange, the UAE will establish full, normalized relations with Israel. And European powers, like France, are calling it a positive step that should kickstart peace negotiations between Israel and the Palestinians again. This deal has been in the works for more than a decade, and there could be a signing ceremony at the White House in the coming weeks. As Trump gets a foreign policy boost, he faces a tough re-election campaign, struggling to contain the coronavirus pandemic, an economic meltdown, and trailing in the polls. We get all the latest from Jared Kushner, the president's son-in-law and senior advisor. Jared Kushner, welcome to the program. Thank you. It's good to be with you. So look, 24 hours after the announcement of this landmark peace deal between Israel and, um, and the United Arab Emirates, um, I just want to ask specifically what precisely you know, your administration did. I mean, you know obviously better than I do that this has been in the works for at least the last 10 years between the parties and you know, with, the, with the help of previous US administrations. Can you tell us how and why it happened now? Uh, the first thing President Trump did was he went to Riyadh in 2017. He assembled the leaders of the 54 Muslim countries and said, guys, we need to be thinking about things differently. We need to uh, solve these problems together, and we need to bring the, the, the region together around common solutions and in a new way. Uh, since then, we've seen a lot of changes. We've seen uh, Israel become closer with the Arab countries. We've rolled back a lot of Iran's aggression in the region, uh, terminated the, the, the really flawed Iran deal. Uh, we've taken back the fiscal caliphate of ISIS, and we've done a lot of work to counter financing of terrorism and to fight the long-term battle uh, against extremism through counter-extremism centers by fighting the battle online. So uh, I think that President Trump was able to build the trust back with all the regional allies that America had and to lay out a strategy, and then we've worked very closely together over the last years to execute that strategy, culminating in the first peace agreement in the region in the last 26 years. So uh, again, there's a lot of... Uh, problems that we've had in the Middle East over time, but uh, very few politicians and leaders have been able to create the breakthrough that President Trump was able to get yesterday. So obviously this is a uh, progress in the region and specifically on an issue that you and I spoke about when you unveiled the Trump administration peace plan for the region. You remember one of the first questions I asked you was, will 
Prime Minister Netanyahu be annexing the West Bank as was provided for. And you said, because he had said that, and you said, no, no, we don't, we don't expect that, that shouldn't happen. It's no secret that you did not want that to happen. Is one of the side benefits or the side benefit of this deal the announcement that that annexation will be suspended by Israel? So politics are messy, and in the Middle East, if there was an elegant solution to solve all these problems, they would have been solved a long time ago. And so you have a lot of different parties that believe in a lot of different things. But ultimately, what happened here was that leaders came together, great leaders like Prime Minister Netanyahu, the Crown Prince Mohammed bin Zayed, and President Trump, and they were able to put what are the interests of the people, the region, and the world ahead of uh, uh, different maybe things that would have been good in the short term, but less helpful in the long term. So. Uh, so that's why we're able to get to this normalization and peace, which will facilitate great trade between the United Arab Emirates and Israel that will facilitate exchanges in technology, health care, tourism. A lot of Muslims throughout the world don't believe that they're able to visit the Al-Aqsa Mosque because their countries don't have diplomatic relations and they can't fly into Tel Aviv and then go visit the mosque. Now Muslims throughout, from throughout the world can fly through Dubai and Abu Dhabi, go to Tel Aviv and they can pray at the mosque and that will help fight against the notion that the extremists put out there that says that people are not allowed to pray at the mosque and that the mosque is under attack. And that's a, a trope that's been used for you know, over 100 years. So uh, in the short term, Israel's agreed to focus their attention on strengthening their relationship with regional partners to improve the security and economic opportunities that exist. And uh, for the time being, they've suspended uh, any efforts to apply Israeli sovereignty to areas of the West Bank. So I just wondered, you know, you say for the time being and suspended, I, I assume Arab nations don't want that to happen. And some of them say, you know, this deal was kind of a victory for us because we managed to get that off the table. My question to you is, is annexation off the table? Because yesterday, Prime Minister Netanyahu said, there's no change to my plan to extend sovereignty, our sovereignty in Judea and Samaria in full coordination with the United States using those biblical words for the West Bank. I mean, is it off the table or is it just, just for the moment? Right, so uh, one of the tough things about your job is you have to look at the snapshot every day. You know, President Trump is a deal maker, he's a pragmatist, uh, he's, he's somebody who's quite flexible. And what we've seen in the Middle East is that things are very fluid and they change. And uh, again, we, we, we knew where we wanted to get to and we've done a lot of different moves that have been unconventional to get to this point. And quite frankly, I personally have been criticized by a lot of the experts who worked on this and failed in the past for not doing it the same way that they did. But uh, where we are today is we've created an environment where we unveiled a 180-page vision for peace and prosperity for the Palestinian people. We've shown uh, we've earned the trust of the Israeli people. We've put out a plan to secure uh, Israel from a security point of view. We put out an economic plan that can double the GDP for the Palestinian people, create a million new jobs, and allow them to improve their way of life. Uh, the map in between Israel and the Palestinians now is something that's existed for a long time. President Trump uh, it was in the real estate business before. He uh, knows meets and bounds very well. We looked at it very carefully. And there are certain realities that have existed after three wars and many years of failed political leadership trying to make a deal that we just took and, and tried to work accordingly with. So President Trump was able to get Israel to agree to a Palestinian state and also to agree uh, to a map. And the reality with the map, the areas in the West Bank right now, is it's populated by Israelis. Uh, Israel's controlling the territory and they're not leaving. And so the notion here is how do we save the possibility for the Palestinians to have a state of their own, to have the ability for economic prosperity, to have dignity in a future, and we've really outlined that. So what this does today is it takes one of the major pillars of what's caused this conflict and the instability in the region really off the table because what you're doing now is you're taking the mosque issue, which quite frankly conflated the dispute between the Muslim world and Israel over all these years, and you really diminish that because now uh, Muslims throughout the world feel like they can go and visit the mosque, and they can. Uh, Israel, in our vision for peace, agreed okay. that, that the king of Jordan was able to stay as the custodian of the mosque. And again, so the religious issue that's caused all of this tension over the years uh, should now be resolved. And now there's a real estate proposal on the table from Israel to the Palestinians, and it's really up to their leadership when they want to engage. And if they do, uh, we're there to help them, and we want them to see to have a great future, and we've got a good plan to help that happen. Okay, let me ask you a couple of questions about what's happening in the news around the White House, around the election right now. 
So the president obviously has raised a lot of eyebrows by commenting and seeming to um, agree and certainly spread this notion that uh, has been perpetuated in the Newsweek by a conservative lawyer that somehow Kamala Harris is unqualified to run for vice president. Um, why would your why would your father-in-law, your candidate, the president, actually do this? What what is the point of of, uh, of spreading that kind of disinformation that is contrary to the United States Constitution? Look, right now you're the one spreading that disinformation. The president was at a coronavirus briefing. Uh, he was asked by a reporter about a report in Newsweek, and his words were, "I don't know anything about that." And, uh, and since then, the media has been going wild, basically saying that he was pushing a theory. Uh, I'll take him at his word that he said he doesn't know anything about that, and that's uh, what he said. But uh, again, I'm here today to talk about the historic peace agreement that President Trump just accomplished in the Middle East, and uh, I'm not sure why that's a topic and I'll ask you that's, another question. Uh, that's relevant. I'll ask you another question about that, but we agreed to talk about a couple of issues in the news. Look. You know, he did it before with Barack Obama until finally in 2016 he agreed that Barack Obama was born in the United States. Why would he do it again? It didn't work then. Why would it work now? And I want to ask you this also. You know, Kamala Harris is African American, she's Indian American, and she's a woman. So you've got racist overtones, you've got misogynistic overtones. Why would the president want to be associated with somebody who wrote that? So, Christian, again, I have so much respect for you, so I'll answer this in the most polite way possible, which, again, is that uh, the president was asked a question. He said he didn't know anything about it, and now that you're insinuating that this is something to do with race, look, if you look at the president's track record over the last three years, uh, before the pandemic, we had the lowest black unemployment in the history of our country. The president passed opportunity zones to bring uh, much-needed access to capital to uh, lower-income communities. He passed a historic criminal justice reform, uh, which, by the way, again, I... I, when I was working on that issue, uh, because again, there was a lot of uh, sentencing disparities that had a disproportionate impact on the black community here in America, uh, I reached out to Senator Harris's office for a meeting to see if she could become part of that solution, and she never returned the phone call. And I worked with Senator Booker and Senator Durbin across the aisle. We got 87 votes in the Senate, and President Trump was able to deliver on something that rolled back very, uh, very racist laws. And so, Again, President Trump's actions have been very consistent with trying to fight for all forgotten Americans. He's done a great job in that. He has an unimpeachable track record in terms of delivering success. But for whatever reason, the media likes to chase down rabbit holes and try to create controversies when one shouldn't exist. Jared, you know that we're not actually doing that. We're just trying to get an answer because this went on for years over President Obama. And it just seems completely outside the moment, given what's happening in your country right now. And it violates the notion that was perpetuated by that op-ed, violates the U.S. Constitution and goes directly against the 14th Amendment. Yeah, Look, uh, let me put Christian. it this way. Sometimes I like yeah. to use this platform as like a, a, a place for a peace offering or, or a mea culpa. You know, you're also a campaign advisor to the president. Would you apologize on behalf of your candidate for, that, for, for him spreading that information? Yeah, look, the president's about to do a press conference any minute. I'll let the CNN reporters ask him about that. Uh, again, we've spent now just as much time on this as we had on uh, the president's historic peace deal. Again, the first peace deal in the Middle East in the last 26 years. And, uh, and again, that's a great accomplishment. And uh, again, I'll go back to the fact that the media often gets distracted and confused by the president, right? They said that if President Trump was elected, there'd be wars all over the world. He would uh, alienate our allies and that uh, the world would be like this. President Trump's been ending the war in Afghanistan. He's cleaned up ISIS in the Middle East. He's cleaned up uh, this. And now he has the first peace deal in 26 years. And he's rebuilt the alliances that the previous administration had alienated. And so, uh, again, let's just focus on what actually impacts the people. I think that this deal will make the Middle East safer. I think for the American people, it gives us less necessity to have troops in the region. Under President Trump's leadership, we've become energy independent as a country, which is critical. So we no longer rely on the Middle East for energy. And most importantly, the, the real risk from this conflict that impacts every country is radicalizing youth. And uh, if you look at all the different jihadists, they use the notion of the Palestinian conflict and they use the notion of uh, the Al-Aqsa Mosque being under attack as an excuse to try to radicalize youth throughout the world. So look, President Trump today accomplished great peace uh, in one of the toughest regions against all odds. Nobody thought that he could do it. Nobody thought that I could do it. Uh, and I do believe that President Trump has shown that he can do this internationally. And he's also going to try to bring people together here at home and bring peace through results. 
uh, through shared prosperity and through doing a great job as president, which Jared, is what he's done. Jared Kushner, you know, many would agree with you that this president has not started any new wars, and that is uh, to, the, to the pleasure, obviously, of, of many, many people. So I want to ask you this. Do you believe, because yesterday when he announced this deal, he said it's big and big things are happening. He didn't elaborate. We've heard from our Israeli sources, in fact, on, on my show last night, that there could be other nations following. Do you think Oman will? Do you think Bahrain will? Will Saudi Arabia follow by normalizing relations with Israel? Sure. Well, I'm not a traditionally trained diplomat, but we were able to keep that deal very, very quiet uh, up until the announcement, which for such big news amongst three countries and uh, a lot of bodies was a big accomplishment. One of the reasons why we've been able to do this is because uh, people trust working with the president, they trust working with me, and that's because, uh, unfortunately for you and the business you're in, we don't show more cards than we need to. Uh, but I can assure you that uh, the work that the president's done over the last three and a half years uh, has really set the table for this success and for a lot more to come. We've seen uh, a lot of um, you know, again, the move sometimes people were understood what he was doing, other people didn't. Tom Friedman wrote a phenomenal column today in the New York Times, and we don't always agree with Tom Friedman, saying that this basically was a, a diplomatic uh, bomb explosion that went off in the Middle East that now makes everything possible. And I will tell you this, Christian, because you, you've been covering this region for a lot of years and have tons of expertise, is that when I first started uh, you know, working on the Middle East, one of the old hands, the experts, said to me uh, that you, you don't make money betting uh, on success in the Middle East. And the truth of the matter is, is that people in the region had grown very full of despair. Uh, it was very, you know, when I would go out and say that things could change, everyone called me uh, naive and they said that, you know, I was putting forward an op too optimistic a vision. Well, this shows people that change actually is possible. And for the people of the region who feel so hopeless and who feel like they've just had setback after setback after setback, this shows them that change is possible. There are great leaders in the region. At the end of the day, people do want to have security. They do want to have prosperity. They want their children to have better jobs than they have and more economic opportunity. And that should be very hopeful. And that uh, one other thing I'll just note is that we did call this the Abraham Accords because Abraham was the father uh, of the three religions. And uh, th this agreement is bigger than just bring two countries together. It's hopefully bridging uh, the relationship between multiple faiths so that people can focus on the fact that we're all human beings, we all deserve to live a better life, and that's, again, another accomplishment yeah. that President Trump was able to do to bring people together. So we're fortunate to be speaking after you to the foreign minister of, uh, of the UAE. So we'll ask him also about how it impacts on the peace proposal or the peace possibility between Israel and the Palestinians. But before I go, I just want to, um, before you go, I just want to ask you a question about mail-in balloting. Again, the president has raised a lot of uh, eyebrows by suggesting that there wouldn't be the financial help to the post office that needs it to be able to process all the mail-in ballots, and uh, implied that it might just not happen because he doesn't want to see it used for mail-in voting. So President Obama, former president, has just weighed in on a podcast with one of his former advisors, David Plouffe, saying, Trump is actively trying to kneecap the Postal Service. He says, what we've seen in a way that is unique in modern political history is a president who's explicit in trying to discourage people from voting. Yeah, so How do you I answer that? And will the president support the Postal Service in what they need to get these ballots you know, processed? First of all, 100%. He's doing everything he can to make sure that they have the resources they need. But you know, you could argue it just the other way, Chris John, which is this is an unprecedented attempt by people to use an unproven method that, quite frankly, they don't have the time or the infrastructure to set up correctly. What you're basically saying is, no, we're relying on the postal system and the federal government to run uh, an unprecedented mass operation in a very efficient way uh, where there's you know, a lot of ex uh, examples of, of that's rife with abuse and fraud. I think what you're seeing on both sides is a lot of posturing. Uh, you see that from what President Obama said. You're seeing it from what President Trump has said. But at the end of the day, what everyone wants is just a fair election where we know what the rules are, where people are not playing games and trying to create opportunities where there's uh, the opportunity for fraud and gamesmanship. Jared Kushner, thank you for joining me. Thank you very much. Have a great day. And, and just to lay out, all the experts say there is virtually no evidence of fraud in any of the mail-in balloting. And yes, everybody does want a free and fair election. So we move now to find out exactly what this deal between the UAE and Israel means 
for the United Arab Emirates. Joining me from Dubai to discuss is Anwar Gargash. He is the UAE Minister of State for Foreign Affairs. Um, Minister Gargash, welcome to the program. Um, can I just ask you, just to sum up for us, how and what this means to you and to the Persian Gulf region there? What material change will happen in the wake of this formalizing of your relationship with Israel? Good evening, uh, Christian. Uh, I think uh, this is a very historical breakthrough, and I would sum it up that uh, three things have been achieved. Uh, I think on the one hand, we have uh, been able, through suspending annexation, to defuse a bomb that was threatening the two-state solution. It's not really uh, resolving the, uh, the Palestinian-Israeli issue, uh, but it is buying time in order for a resumption of these negotiations and to save the two-state solution. Because the history of this crisis clearly, clearly shows that facts on the ground change possibilities. So I think we should really not lose this opportunity because we've been very good at losing opportunities uh, in our region. I think the second thing right. is the right. deal... Uh, the deal clearly has a give and take. That's really uh, the take that we have gotten. The give that the United Arab Emirates has given is the normalization of relations with Israel. And here, I would say that this is a process that has started. Uh, the, uh, it started with inviting Israel to Expo, Israel having uh, a delegation in IRENA, which is the renewable energy organization. So for, you, for us, this was really a matter of time. But we thought that if we can actually get this suspension of annexation, then this will be a win-win situation. I think the third and last thing here is that this is in a, truly a strategic shift. It's a strategic shift of hope. Clearly, 70 years of not communicating with Israel has led us nowhere. And I think uh, we need to shift to a new uh, method of doing things. And that method simply is, we can disagree with you on political issues, but we can work together in non-political issues. And I think this is the sort of model that we've been calling for. There has been soul searching and reviewing of this, but that is really the crux of the deal, Christian. So let me take, take a few of those issues because they're all really important. Um, the idea of the of staving off annexation. I mean, you've probably read yes. Haaretz. You know, they basically have said that Bibi Netanyahu never had a plan really to annex. He never presented a plan to Parliament. There was never anything formal that they surmised that it was you know sort of a a bit of leverage that he had. And now he's got this diplomatic recognition from you. And to that point, he has said that it is still on the table. I read it out to Jared Kushner, as you could see, and Jared Kushner admitted that this is, for the moment, for now, this annexation has been staved off. What leverage well, do you have, and do you believe that this is staved off forever? Again, Christian, nothing is forever. But what, uh, what is clear to me is a clear differentiation between the politics of a country and the commitments of a country. And for me, I differentiate between these because you have here clear commitments. I mean, the United States is involved. The process also of normalization is a process. It's not going to happen tomorrow or the day after. And at the same time, Israel really has a chance now to uh, really create a confidence with a major Arab economy uh, a country that doesn't really have borders with Israel. So I would differentiate really between the murky politics of all Middle Eastern countries and the rhetoric that we hear, but the commitments of states. I will tell you that we, in our contacts with many, many Arab capitals, many, many European capitals, the issue of annexation has actually been like a time bomb that everybody's been worried about. So we've taken that annexation issue off the table. We've bought time. I'm okay. not going to say that okay. this is in perpetuity, 
but it really does uh, give us time because otherwise the two-state solution would be dead. Okay, so this is where, what I want to ask you about. You've bought time for what? Because you're right, the two-state solution mm. looks like it is dead. And you've also said something that others agree with, that staying away from engaging with Israel, the Arab nations, has brought you not much. But the question is, what will you do now that you are at the table? Because the Palestinian leadership has called this a betrayal. And as you know perfectly well, the Arab League position was no separate deals unless there is a deal between Israel and the Palestinians. So the Palestinians say they had no idea. They were blindsided. They didn't know about this deal. So you didn't tell them. Now what can you do to use your leverage at the table to re-engage and create a process that may revive the idea of a two-state solution? Well, Christian, here I have to emphasize that, as uh, Jared Kushner said, we told nobody, all our contacts with our uh, Arab friends, brothers, and strategic partners were really after the announcement of the deal in order for us to make sure that uh, that there is no leak. So this is something that we decided was essential for the deal. Right now, of course, the whole idea is that we are urging the Palestinian leadership to, uh, to take this advantage. I mean, the United Arab Emirates is not the one that will actually conduct the negotiations, but we've been urging the Palestinians to stay engaged. Difficult and despairing uh, times are here, they are all around us, but this has been the state of the Middle East all these years. And for us, we've been mm -hmm. consistent with our message. And I think it is important here that we have been a traditional and historical supporter of the Palestinians. And I think we saw an opportunity here where we leveraged uh, the issue of normalization and Israel's wanting to normalize with one of the largest Arab economies and said, well, we're going to do that, but what we need in return is this suspension. And we understand, as I said, that this suspension will buy us space, will buy us time. And I think we need to all urge the Palestinians to engage. If you really look at okay. the responses that we are hearing from the EU, from European capitals, from everybody, that has been a traditional supporter of negotiations and a two-state solution. Everybody is ecstatic about taking this off the table and being able to come back and to engage. And I think our urging to the Palestinians is to use this opportunity and not to lose it because our history in the region is a history of missed opportunities. Okay. Well, as you heard, um, the head of the PA has called it a great betrayal. But I want to ask you, are you prepared for people to disagree, even in the United Arab Emirates? Um, you know, the, we always wonder, what will the street do? What will the street say? So the Arab Spring activist Ayad al-Baghdadi has tweeted that the government, your government, linked Twitter feeds, are calling for a crackdown on dissent within the UAE over this deal. What do, you, what do you make of this? It says UAE government linked verified account calling upon UAE security authorities to monitor the tweets of UAE residents who disagree with the UAE-Israel normalization plan and expel them from the country. Is that really no, your okay. policy I now? Mean, I, mean, I'm, I mean, Twitter uh, in, in our region uh, is a jungle. But what I have really seen in, in the Gulf here of course, you will hear different opinions. You will hear, you know, I mean, this is a very emotive issue. The Palestinian issue is a very emotive issue. But I think with a lot of the younger generation, you know, we hear all the time. We have tried what our fathers and grandfathers have done, and we've gotten nowhere. We do need to try differently. We need to look at things differently. Of course, there are many activists who will have this view or that view. And I think this is a nature of Twitter. I mean, there is an argument on, in, on Twitter in our region, very violent argu arguments every day about everything. But I think overall mm -hmm. in the Gulf, I am really seeing a new sense of a new reality 
that we really need to do things yeah. differently. And that's yeah. really the strategic shift and the rays of hope that I am seeing. So finally, um, uh, Minister Gargash, would you then say that it looks like the shift that you're talking about is kind of away from the Palestinians and more towards solidifying and building up an alliance against Iran, this whole situation that, I, that, I, that, that we've been talking about and certainly the Trump administration with its maximum pressure um, has, has wanted to you know, put forth? Well, again, uh, you know, it's not, you know, the whole uh, announcement is not about Iran. It's really about our Arab priorities and mainly vis-a-vis -vis our relations with Israel and about uh, suspending annexation. It's not about Iran. Iran is tangential in this. But it's not really uh, in, in the Arab sphere today. There is heavy polarization of Iran and Turkey trying to expand their influence within the Arab zone. It's not only about Iran. But what we're really seeing today is not about Iran. It is mainly about uh, trying to find other ways through strategic shift, first of all, by taking away the annexation uh, issue off the table, looking at this issue and encouraging the Palestinians to re-engage. As we do that, we think we will have more leverage on the Israelis if we have channels of communication, if we have more normalization, and we can have with the Israelis disagreements that are political about how they do things uh, with regards to the Palestinian issue, to, with regards to their uh, relationship with the Arab world, but at the same time, look with a fresh eye on other issues because we've tried the old methods and they haven't worked. Right. So very quickly and very finally, do you expect um, Oman, Bahrain, Saudi Arabia to follow you uh, and do the same thing? Well, uh, again, these are sovereign decisions, but I am uh, I'm very uh, encouraged by statements coming out of uh, Oman, statements coming out of Bahrain. I'm very encouraged about uh, the Saudi press, about statements coming out from the Egyptian president, uh, I think that this is a polarized region. There's never the right moment. And we need to understand that decisions like these need to come without much attention of waiting for the right moment. Because clearly, okay. we need to do what we have to do. And I think we've been successful in suspending annexation. All right, and we'll, we'll follow up with you in the days and weeks that come. Anwar Gargash, Minister of State for Foreign Affairs, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Now, global approval of the U.S. foreign policy, of course, has taken a hit during the Trump presidency, illustrated starkly in this Gallup poll, which paints the picture from 2012 onwards. But could the deal between Israel and the UAE mark a shift? For more on what we could expect, I'm joined by Middle East scholar Vali Nasser, professor at the Johns Hopkins School of International Studies, and former member of the European Parliament, Mariche Shake. Welcome both of you to the program. Vali, because you know this region so well, I wonder what your thoughts are about this peace deal, what you've heard Jared Kushner say tonight, what you've just heard Anwar Gargash say, uh, where it leaves the region as a whole. Well, uh, the region as a whole will not see much change because the Israeli-UAE, Israeli-Saudi relationship has been there for some time. It has been an open secret that there are intelligence, military, and diplomatic ties between them. Now it's been formalized, uh, and, uh, and largely this has been formalized because, not because of the region, but because it benefits all the parties at this moment in time. President Trump desperately needs a foreign policy victory. Uh, North Korea hasn't panned out. With China, things are going sideways. He has not been able to get Iran to the negotiating table. This way, he can basically claim a victory, and it's a victory that will be popular with evangelical voters in the United States, and uh, he needs that. Uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu uh, is a big winner. He's facing corruption charges. He really could not go forward with annexation. And for him, this is, a, this is a wonderful victory. He can tell Israelis that there is no trade-off between 
uh, being aggressive on the Palestinian issue and normalizing relations with Israel. And he's now historically important in having uh, established uh, diplomatic ties with, with a third Arab country. And for UAE, uh, I think there is a worry more about Washington than is about Iran. Uh, we know that UAE and Saudi Arabia got very close to the Trump administration, that they are worried about a democratic backlash uh, when uh, a, a new administration comes in or if the Congress becomes even more democratic. The progressive wing of the Democratic Party is very critical of the war in Yemen. And, and a good news of, of peace building with Israel in the Middle East will help cushion uh, some of the blow that they might expect after the election. And I, and I think all of them sort of saw this moment as necessary to come forward and try to take maximum advantage of this deal. But on the ground, it doesn't change anything between uh, UAE and Iran. It doesn't change the lay of the land in Syria. Uh, it doesn't change Libya. Uh, it, it just formalizes what has already been there as an axis of cooperation between the Persian Gulf uh, Emirates and Israel. Really interesting to get that perspective. Marice Shake, let me ask you from the European perspective, because we have had European leaders um, react to this deal. Uh, we've had them praise the deal, but with the condition, of course, as, as, as Mr. Gargash was talking about, of, of using it as a, an ability or a method to restart negotiations between Israel and Palestine for a two-state solution. Do you see that as possible? And how much does that mean now still for Europe? Well, I think it is definitely still the priority for the European Union. Uh, and I, I encourage leaders to be more active in the geopolitical sphere and especially in the Middle East. And it is clear that with everything that's already happening in the Middle East, the last thing people there, but also the EU need is more instability, more conflict and more polarization. And so I think that should be the priority for uh, European leaders. And uh, it is unfortunate that the United States under President Trump has become much less of a reliable partner there. Uh, we've seen the surprise withdrawal of, tr of troops from Syria, but also the walking away from the Iran nuclear deal, which even if it was sold in the United States as a, a big success or a necessary step, was really perceived as a big disappointment and a slap in the face uh, for Europeans who were deeply invested in that and, and where we still see the instability and the tensions that have come from the US uh, not adhering the deal. And that for a president that you know, promises and actually prides himself in being a deal maker uh, shows that there's a lot of deal breaking going on as well. So let me ask you, Marije, before I go back to Valley on the Iran nuclear deal, because that was one of the hallmark things that President Trump said he was going to get out of uh, when he came into office, and he did. What impact is it having on Europe? And does it make you feel safer, less safe? And do you hope that if there is another administration, a new administration, that somehow there's enough of it that can be stitched back together or a deal plus? Well, it is clear that the EU, uh, along with, with many global partners, was actually very invested in, in this diplomatic deal with uh, the Obama administration as well. And so even if it was announced, it was still very disappointing and I think harmful for the perspective of allowing diplomatic negotiations between global powers to render success. And so we've seen European leaders scrambling to uh, cushion the fallout of the US walking away, for example, by economic instruments. Uh, and there's still ongoing questions about the extension of the arms embargo playing out at the UN uh, as we speak. So definitely Europeans will look uh, with, with great hope to uh, a, a new administration, uh, if that uh, indeed is elected, to renegotiate uh, diplomatically with the Iranians. And uh, I can only hope that it will not be too late because not only will the Middle East suffer more than it already does, but also the EU will be the first to feel the effects of further escalation and militarization of, of any conflict in the Middle East. So, Vali, let me ask you, because uh, you know this deal you know, just about as well as, as anybody does, and we're hearing reports that um, members of the Trump administration, either, you know, in the open or behind the scenes are trying to do everything they can to make sure that coming out of the deal is irreversible, hedging their bets in, in, case, in case he should lose and tying a future president's hands. 
What future do you see for any deal on, on, on at this level with a new administration? Well, I, I think whether pre President Trump gets reelected or there's a new administration, I think the current situation with Iran cannot continue. Uh, the United States has shown that it can exert enormous amount of pressure uh, on, on a country as well as on its allies, uh, but it cannot force a, a change in the policy of that country. And I think the problem uh, with pre President Trump has been that he has said that he wants a new deal with Iran, but in reality he has behaved like he wants regime change. And that has destroyed any trust in what U.S. intentions might be. So I think a, a new administration would have to basically try to reconstitute a trust in American policy, not Iranian trust in American policy, but also European, Chinese, and Russian trust in American policy. And, and I think one of the problems is that we don't know how much damage will be done between now and January. I mean, as we're talking today, the United States is, is, is launching its resolution at the United Nations to try to force an extension of, uh, of uh, uh, arms embargo on Iran over European, Chinese, and Russian uh, uh, objections. Uh, and, and essentially running roughshod over, over the Security Council rules, over multilateral policies. So, so in a way, uh, uh, you know, the U.S. objective now is very simple, which is, which is that the current deal has to break apart. It hasn't over the past four years to force Iran to sign a new deal. But it actually doesn't have a pathway of how it gets there. So, so the, I think the Biden administration, as it said, will try to go back to the deal at least as a ground level baseline from which they can then think about how do you get Iran back into negotiations about other things and how do you get the Europeans, Chinese, and the Russians to support an American policy. I, I, I want to start sort of, well, I want to ask you both to cast your minds back to four years ago, convention season four years ago, 2016, and in Cleveland at the Republican convention, that's when President Trump, just as he was getting there, basically poured cold water all over the idea of NATO. Remember calling it obsolete and then going off on NATO. I don't know how much NATO and the Allies took him seriously or what they thought might happen if he did become president, but let us just play a little mashup of what he said back then. Number one, NATO is obsolete. And number two, the people aren't paying their way. It's obsolete and we pay too much money. NATO. We're going to have the people that aren't paying. They're going to start paying. It's obsolete. They were getting ripped in NATO. They don't pay their bills. They are delinquent. NATO is obsolete and has to be rejiggered. Well, we, we get the point, guys. <laughs> um, so, Marice, when you all heard that four years ago, and now four years later, how is that working out for the alliance? Well, I think, as Vali said about the relationship with so many global partners, it is clear that trust and a sense of predictability, and especially in, in NATO, a sense of alliance, has uh, has really moved very, very far apart since since that speech four years ago. Uh, I think it, it may not be something that politicians will say out loud, uh, but as a former politician, I still speak to, to a lot of my, my colleagues there is a permanent sense of damage control, of trying to avoid uh, disaster and of trying to really uh, avoid any kind of fallout and, and keep together what can be done. So really tiptoeing around this president. And I think that that in and of itself is very damaging for an alliance like, uh, like NATO. Now, having said that, I think the spending issue has improved since four years ago. And um, generally, it is important that we don't dismiss the significance of NATO as an alliance uh, in partnership with the European Union as it strengthens is its defense and security capabilities, because clearly the threats that the alliance is facing, tensions with Russia, violations of international law, uh, the annexation of Crimea, uh, wars that that are really threatening or escalations of tensions uh, that we're facing it is very important that we don't dismiss the alliance too easily as we just heard uh, that speech of four years ago in which the president has and even even more recently i think there was concern about the us not taking the alliance seriously enough and potentially even stepping away from it so uh, the the urgency could not be greater and i really hope that we will not see further uh, escalations there either 
So, so Vali, uh, you know, when it comes to Joe Biden and whether he might win the, the next election, we've got, um, we've got, you know, a lot of uh, commentary about what might happen. Um, you know, Dan Dresner, professor of international politics at Tufts, says there's a chance of a V-shaped recovery, i.e. In, in foreign policy in the alliance if Biden wins, similar to the way Obama helped change America's image after he beat or after he came in after George W. Bush in the Iraq war. But then another international observer, James Traub, has just written in foreign policy, the great question that Biden will face, how must America adapt to a world that looks very different from the one you left in 2016? America is wounded today in a way that it was not then, in a way that it has not been since before Joe Biden was born. Vali, what could happen then if there was a, another administration to try to right some of the imbalance that Mauricio has just been talking about in terms of of America and its allies and, and the trust that you've just all been talking about? Well, I, I think uh, the idea that we'll have a V-shaped recovery back to where we were is perhaps optimistic, although one never knows. But I think there are a number of things here that are at play. One is that uh, the, the financial burden of the pandemic will make it very difficult for the United States to resume the same degree of leadership in the world as before. We will be internally focused. The virus may not be even gone before 2021 or sometime in 2022. And, and therefore, the idea that uh, this is only a matter of change of president is, is, is perhaps optimistic. Secondly, uh, there's, there's now new facts on the ground that have happened. In other words, the, the nuclear deal with Iran is in trouble, or, or with China, the president has, has really changed the, 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 the tenor of the relationship and put it on a collision course and a cold war. Uh, that this will not just snap back if, if he goes. And I think thirdly, if you're sitting outside the United States, uh, whether you're in Europe or you're in China or in the Middle East, what you see is that this president still has about 30% at least popularity among the American electorate. He has spent four years mm -hmm. educating Americans that Europe is the enemy, Russia is the friend, and, and that Americans have once elected somebody like Trump, uh, they may do it again. Maybe in four years' time, uh, mm -hmm. there'll be another one. And, and I think it's not just trust in the American leadership, it's trust in the American people. And, yeah. and I think countries are gonna try to protect themselves from a repeat of a populist, you know, disruptive American president again coming to power. And, and Biden has to deal with all yeah. of these things. He cannot basically just pretend this hasn't happened. So just very quickly then to Marice, you know, obviously Trump is trailing in the polls, but he could win. What does Europe or the world expect from four more years of Trump? What, what, that, what might that look like in terms of foreign policy? Well, I think the world is clearly holding its breath, and certainly I know many European uh, people are. When you walk outside here in the park, that's de definitely what you hear, but also politicians. Uh, I think the biggest concern is what it will mean for the ability of democratic countries to work together. We just heard Jared Kushner repeating attacks on the press again. There's deep concerns about the elections and the democratic rights of American people being respected mm -hmm. in November, and that clearly hurts and undermines the ability of the United States to play a leading role in defending democracy and defending human rights right at a moment where they're already under pressure and under attack. So I think that that is the thing to watch out for most, and I can only hope that the EU steps up where the U.S. steps back. All right. Marie J. Shake, Vali Nasser, thank you so much indeed. And finally tonight, something different. Wishing you a song. Now, after 34 years on London's West End, the Phantom of the Opera is now just a memory. The end of that hugely popular musical is a major example of the damage COVID has done to theatre. It is composer Andrew Lloyd Webber has been the UK government's point person throughout the pandemic, and he is now taking part in a COVID-19 vaccine trial and paraphrased a line from another musical, Oliver, to tweet, I'll do anything to get theatres large and small open again and actors and musicians back to work. For months, he has been streaming some of his classics free on YouTube. We talked about it when we spoke at the height of lockdown.
Andrew Lloyd Webber, welcome to the program. I, I want to start by asking you um, how you're doing with your sort of online performances now. You, you've started sh the shows must go on. And it's not just for entertainment, although it is. What's the bigger purpose um, as you decided to put Phantom and the others, you know, streaming? Well, I, one of the most important things is we were able to, if people wish to donate to the Actors Fund, that's really terrific. I mean, yeah. uh, I've yeah. been doing my bit as a producer through Broadway Cares, but um, that it's a, it's a wonderful way of being able to help. But also at this point, I mean, I've been very lucky in my career, and I think it's a way of giving something back to the audiences who've you know, been so good to me. And uh, it maybe it also introduces people to the theatre who may not have even thought of going to a theatre. You never know. I think you've got a, a, a musical that I think has been either stopped before it started or, or closed very quickly, Cinderella. Oh, yes, well, it hasn't closed, no. Um, it's uh, it been stopped in its tracks. I mean, we were supposed to be doing a workshop mm -hmm. for the last three mm -hmm. weeks, uh, not being able to do it, although thanks to Zoom calls and things, we've been able to continue with all the writing and we've been able to make sure that we've finished it. Of course, quite when we're going to be able to put it on now is an open question because the big question all of us are asking is, when is it going to be possible to go back to the theatre again? When, it, when are the theatres going to be open? And then, of course... Um, even when the theatres are open, our audience is going to feel safe uh, to go. Uh, I think we've got a, a moment now, I think, um, particularly on Broadway, where I, I think it, it's very, very important that everybody pulls together. I don't mean just, uh, uh, you know, the, the writers and the, and, and the actors and everything, but I think everybody backstage, stagehands, um, you know, and indeed the theatre owners have got to pull mm -hmm. together to make it you know, impossible for the public to go. I don't think there's going to be the, the money around to spend on theatre tickets in the way perhaps there has been. And, and I feel very strongly that we've got to try and make theatre as accessible and as safe as possible for people to go to. Just talk to me a little bit about the, the everyday actors, many of the people who work in theatre, even if they're not on stage. I mean, just to make it happen, what they must be going through right now in terms of loss of revenue, loss of job and uncertainty. What are you hearing? Well, it's, it, it's a practice, not so much hearing, it's seeing. Um, it, it's just uh, very, very difficult for absolutely everybody. Uh, you know, I, as a theatre owner in London, you know, what do we... What do we do? It's very, it's very difficult for all of us. Um, I mean, the, the, I've chosen in Britain to support the uh, Musicians Benevolent Fund because our uh, musicians here are, are freelance in a way perhaps that they, they aren't in, is to the same extent in America. And it's, it's a very big issue for the musicians. Um, but of course, the big issue that you have, uh, which, which of course we don't have here, is, is that we do have free health care. And my biggest concern for the actors and for everybody in New York and all, all over America in the, where our shows have been is, is that it's the healthcare issue that I, I feel most, most, most concerned and worried about. I know that you have a foundation, you, you provide free music for many people who may not be able to in scholarships and this. Just quickly before we end, tell us what you have found and what you think is the value added of music to people, whether when they can come to theatre or when they can't and when they're closed off in a moment of such deep anxiety? Well, I think, um, as uh, I, I found, I think we all know over the years, really, that music empowers. And that's why I'm particularly, uh, particularly keen and passionate about music in education, because one scene in schools where perhaps uh, they come from difficult areas or backgrounds where, where, uh, where, where they they have social problems. Uh, music has been the common denominator force for the good. And the thing about music mm -hmm. is, is that, you know, it, it transcends all languages. I can give you an example of one school uh, where I thought it was 46 different languages, but in fact it was 60 different languages that were spoken there. And music is the common denominator. And I feel mm -hmm. passionately that music should be the right of every child everywhere. And I think that this moment, mm -hmm. music is a great leveller. And well, we've seen what? so much fantastic music online during this, and I, I just wondered whether you would be so good as to play us out as we say good goodbye. 
I will do. What I'll do is play a little bit of Think of Me, because on Sunday, I've been doing these challenges. Uh, Think of Me ends with a cadenza, you know, where the singer takes off and uh, sings something which is really very difficult. I've asked people on this coming Sunday to make up their own cadenza. And I tell you what, if we get some really good ones, we'll put them into Phantom of the Opera <laughs> when we reopen in London and Broadway. Okay. So I'll do a little bit of Think of Me. Here we go. Andrew Lloyd Webber chatting and playing back at the height of lockdown. And now, as we said, being vaccinated under the Oxford University trials just to do his part, he says, to try to make sure theatres can reopen safely. And that is it now for our programme. Remember that you can always follow me and the show on Twitter. Thank you for watching Amanpour and Company on PBS and join us again next time.